All right, we'll start another week of class here. Uh, we've left one more topic hanging about the age of the earth. I recommend you get the book and read uh, In the Beginning by Walt Brown. It is just real thoroughly documented. As I've traveled the last couple of weeks, I went through it again carefully and made all sorts of notes, and it's just an awesome book. Now, I met with Walt Brown last week when I was in Phoenix. I called. I had a four-hour layover at the airport, so... He lives in Phoenix, Arizona. I called. We went and had lunch together. He came to the airport, and we talked for several hours, had a good talk. Uh, he still disagrees about the canopy theory, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. He's not convinced there's uh, solid evidence for a canopy. And I listened to his objections and said, well, I, you know, I think that's it's not, it's not good enough. So otherwise, you know, other than that minor detail, I think we'd agree on most things. And uh, really recommend the book, thoroughly documented. So external reading might be something you'd want right there. We have those, like 17 bucks, aren't they, or 17.50, right, through our ministry. Or you can get it from him for 17.95 if you prefer. Get 24.95 from him, okay, <laughs> so we can get it for 17.50. Okay, one thing we did not yet talk about is the dust on the moon for the age of the earth. Let me give you a little historical perspective about this. Uh, when I was in Texas, one of my students' uh, dad worked for NASA in Houston, and he brought me this space capsule window. Uh, you can see the pock marks. I don't know if it's going to show up on video there or not, if I get the light on it just right. Yeah, they can get the light to pan past it. You'll see it's all scratched and pitted right in here. This is from little tiny dust particles in space. Let me set this dumb thing down. Okay. If you're going, uh, if you're going 17 or 18 or 20,000 miles an hour and you run into a speck of dust, it's likely to scratch the glass. You run into a big rock, it's going to be really hard on the space capsule and the rock, but they don't seem to be as concerned about that. The outer space is full of dust. Nobody questions that. This has been known for a long time, that space contains a lot of dust. Nobody cared, though, because they weren't going up there to travel through space. So, you know, it didn't matter. But when they decided to attempt landing on the moon, they said, you know, we better check and see how much dust is coming in. Quite a few studies were done on the amount of dust in space. Now, this is a little difficult to measure. So, uh, they did a variety of tests. One of them was on top of one of the Hawaiian volcanoes, top of a real tall mountain in Hawaii. They collected dust because they figured it would, it would be less likely to be contaminated with the wind-blown uh, dust off the nearby land because there is no land nearby. It's all, you know, water. And they collected dust. They tried it with a couple of the high-altitude planes. I believe the U-2, but I'm not sure about that. They went up and dropped down a like a filter from a furnace filter and flew along in real high altitude for X number of miles for X, you know, certain time and calculated the area of the filter and how much dust they collected and said, okay, now how big is the world and how much dust is there in space? And through a variety of tests, they came up with varying numbers of how much dust is coming in from space called cosmic dust. It appears to be from several different sources. Comets or meteors that have burned up and the fragments are coming in to the Earth. Littleton, a famous uh, astronomer, said in 1955, now this date is important, in 55, he said that the X-rays and UV light striking the moon could, during the age of the moon, be sufficient to form a layer over it several miles deep. He predicted a dust layer several miles deep on the moon. Isaac Asimov said in 1959, this is also important, they hadn't been to the moon yet. He said, I get a picture, therefore, of the first spaceship picking out a nice level place for landing purposes, coming in slowly downward tail first and sinking majestically out of sight. Science Digest, January 1959, page 36. So many people in the late 50s and early 60s were predicting it would be impossible to land on the moon because of all the dust that might be there. Here's a children's book from 1959. They said there is just deep gray dust, 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 dust. Nothing on the moon but dust. Nobody knew for sure how, good, how thick it would be, but the estimates ranged around an inch every 10,000 years would be the amount of dust accumulating. Some said it was more, some said it was less. Okay. The fact is there should be an awful lot of dust if the moon is billions of years old. Uh, kind of a last-minute thing, they decided to extend the legs on this lunar landing module and put the big, what's called a duck foot, the big, to spread the weight out like a snowshoe. They put these uh, landing pads on there. They did not lengthen the ladder, though. They thought they would sink into the dust far enough that they wouldn't have to lengthen the ladder any. Notice the ladder is too short. The ladder is actually 18 inches too short. Then they got there and landed on it. They thought, you know, this might be a problem. If the guy, 
when he jumps, if he jumps down 18 inches, you know, could he get a rip in his suit? You don't want to get a rip in your space suit out there. Okay, you're in an extremely hostile environment, a pure vacuum or close. So the ladder was indeed too short, and there's all kinds of models of this at different places. When they got there and walked on the moon, though, they discovered, of course, there's very little dust on the moon. Chicago Tribune, July 21st, which was two days after the landing, or no, that was going to be a week after the landing, July, July 20th, they landed on the moon. Yeah, the next day. Now, section 1, page 1, ran an article about the, where's the dust in space? Where is it? It wasn't there, and everybody was surprised. Some of the Christians and some of the non-Christians had argued there's not going to be any dust on the moon. And some people today give creationists a hard time if they mention the dust argument because they'll say it's been proven wrong years ago. Well, no, it hasn't been proven wrong. What happened was they left some plates behind to collect dust on the moon and see how much dust actually hits the moon, how many fragments and particles hit the moon of various sizes. Um, they found out by measuring certain particle sizes, this, this graph is from Walt Brown's book in the beginning. He has a very thorough answer to the lunar dust uh, question near the end of the book in his frequently asked questions uh, section here that uh, goes through all sorts of interesting information if you want to get more on that. But uh, he said uh, they measured certain particle sizes. How many of this size hit the moon? How many of this size hit the moon? Well, if you look at the moon tonight, you'll see there have obviously been a few impacts of some much larger pieces. I mean, there are craters up there that are gigantic. So they, they interpolate or infer the data between the particle sizes that were measured. Plus, the other problem is when you lay a plate up there to collect impact, you know, artic particles coming in, it's not going to do the same as it would do if the particle just plain hits the moon. When the particle hits the moon, it blows up a cloud of dust, which comes back down. When they drilled down into the lunar soil and brought it back and tested it, they found only one out of 67 particles was actually from space. So by measuring the amount of dust hitting these plates, you've got to multiply that times 67 to get the true number for the depth of the lunar soil. Because most of the lunar soil is uh, kicked up dust that was already there. You figure a dust particle hitting at 18,000 miles an hour packs quite a wallop. The uh, mass times the velocity, you know, is, uh, is how it works. And even though there's not much mass, there's an awful lot of velocity. It's moving real fast. He goes through all the formulas in his book right here. It turned out the actual measured amount of dust turned out to be 2.7 inches per million years. Not near what they thought. They thought it would be an inch every 10,000 years. 2.7 per million is a whole lot less. And the skeptics will argue... The dust rate ratio is much less than they expected. I agree. However, you figure 2.7 inches per million years, and they, they tell everybody the moon is 4.6 billion years old, that still should have made 1,000 feet of dust on the moon. The moon dust argument is still legitimate. Okay, Though some people have said you shouldn't use the moon dust argument. Sometimes I don't use it in my seminars just for sake of time because I only give 55 minutes you know, per church session typically or wherever I'm speaking. And so I sometimes will leave that out. But it's still a very legitimate argument. In 1981, uh, Walt Brown, this is, these quotes are right from the back of his book here. He said, I had a conversation with Dr. Herbert Zook of the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. He had been intimately involved in estimating the thickness of the dust layer on the moon before the first Apollo moon landing. He also helped analyze the lunar material brought back from the moon. Of the many interesting things he told me and sent me by mail, one is critical in answering the above question. NASA did not realize until the moon dust and rocks were analyzed that only one part in 67, or 1.5%, of the debris on the moon came from outer space. The rest was pulverized moon rock. In hindsight, this makes perfect sense. Meteorites that strike the moon travel about seven times faster than a bullet, averaging 60, 20 kilometers per second. When they strike the moon, they are not slowed down by an atmosphere, as on Earth, because the moon has no atmosphere. Therefore, the projectile, regardless of size, instantaneously vaporizes and kicks up a cloud of pulverized moon rock. The vaporized meteorite then condenses on the pulverized moon rocks. This was determined by slicing moon rocks and finding them coated by meteoric, meteoric nickel, meteoric material, material rich in nickel. Uncoated moon rocks have practically no nickel. In this way, NASA arrived at the factor of 62.2. And uh, he covers this in his book about the uh, details here, the velocity that it's going and how much um, energy it would carry 
and how much rock it would pulverize. So the moon dust argument is still, I think, very legitimate. All right, let's talk about uh, the Garden of Eden, what this time was like from the creation until the flood. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 3. The Bible says, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. And, of course, it's obvious to anybody that's lived very long, there's a lot of scoffers in this world, people that scoff at God's word. I deal with them all the time, and I enjoy it, actually. And it says they're going to walk after their own lust. I'm convinced, after doing this for 30-some years now, that the reason people scoff at the Bible is because of their lifestyle, not because of they have any scientific reason to reject God's word. When we were living over on Burgess Road about 10 years ago, a student called me from University of West Florida. He said, Mr. Hovind, uh, I understand you believe in creation. I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm a senior at the, in anthropology class, a major in anthropology at UWF, and I believe in evolution, and I'd like to come do an interview with you. I said, well, that'd be fine. Come on over. He came over, talked to me for two hours. After two hours, he said, you know, evolution's not true, is it? I said, no, sure not. He said, man, I've been taught this all my life. He said, you just undid in two hours what I've learned in 20 years. He said, i got to go back and write a report. Can I borrow some books? I said, sure. I loaned him a few good books on creation. I said, just bring them back in a week or two, please. So he called me about a week or so later and said, hey, I'd like to bring your books back. I'm coming by. I said, come on over. He came over, set my books on my counter, kitchen counter there on Burgess Road. He said, well, I decided to stick with evolution. I said, would you like me to tell you why? He said, you think you know why? I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know why. I said, Tim, you sat on my couch two weeks ago and you became convinced that creation was true. Evolution was not true. As you read these books, you probably became even more convinced. And then as you thought about it, you realized, you know, if there's a, if the creation story is true, there's a creator. And if there's a creator, there might be some rules. You know, thou shalt not. <laughs> and you don't like those rules. And so there's probably something in your lifestyle that uh, would be would have to change if you accepted the idea of a creator. So you decided to stick with evolution because it's more convenient for your lifestyle. So basically, you're sticking with evolution because of your sin. Am I right, Tim? He said, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and left. <laughs> Got him right between the eyes. That's exactly why people reject God's word. There's no scientific reason. It's because of their lust. Spelled out for us. Next verse says, they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. We get into a lot more of that on video number four of our series on what the, um, the scoffers are going to say. The way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. Long, slow, gradual processes. That's called uniformitarianism. We won't get into that now. We will later. The next verse says, though, for this they willingly are ignorant. Willingly ignorant. I tell people in the Greek that means dumb on purpose. The scoffers are willingly ignorant. They don't want to know about two things. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old. God just spoke and created the heavens by his word. He didn't lift a finger to make the world. He just spoke and all the molecules obeyed. They even came into existence by his speaking. He speaks and the wind stops. He speaks and the dead come to life. The waves lay down. Everything in the universe obeys his voice, except us. He's having a little trouble with us now, but he's, he's going to fix that someday too. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But the scoffers are ignorant of how God, by his word, made the heavens. Notice heaven is plural. How the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Kind of a strange verse. How can the earth be out of the water and in the water at the same time? Well, the scoffers are ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth. That's the original creation right here about 6,000 years ago. They're also ignorant of the flood which is what it says in the next verse, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now you will find some, Eric, as you go around teaching, that will say this is, re this is referring to Lucifer's flood. There are those who have made up this idea that there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 in Genesis 1, and that during that time Lucifer fell from heaven, and there's a Lucifer's flood, and that's what this is talking about. Well, all of that business about Lucifer's flood is pure baloney. There's zero evidence for it at all. If there was a Lucifer's flood, Noah's flood would have wiped out all the evidence for it. By the way, as I read Walt Brown's book, he, he made a statement in here that just absolutely fascinated me this, this last week as I was, wherever I was going. Um, 
He said, if you get a, a tank, like we, we ought to try this for here for the kids when they come for our children's ministry, uh, an aquarium. If anybody's got an old aquarium that we can use, we'd like to get one. Fill it full of sand, rocks, gravel, all sorts of stuff, and let air bubbles bubble up through the bottom. As the air bubbles come up, it lifts the particle and then drops it again. The sand particles will be lifted and dropped, right? When the waves come in on the beach, as the wave is real tall, it presses the sand down. And then when you go into a, a, a low spot in the wave called a trough, it's less pressure, so the sand lifts up. That's why if you go out in the beach just a few feet and put your head underwater, you see sand flying up all over the place. Well, the sand flying up is from the pressure and then the release of pressure as the waves go over. Imagine during Noah's flood, as the waves go over or as the moon, as the tide goes over, all of the sediments are going to be lifted and dropped, lifted and dropped millions of times. Now, when you lift it and drop it and lift it and drop it, the heavier particles work their way to the bottom, the lighter particles work their way to the top, and it's stratified. So they took, uh, one guy did an experiment where he took a dead reptile, a dead bird, uh, a couple of dead animals of various different kinds, put them in the, in, in the uh, sand, rocks, gravel, mud, mixed it all together, and just had it be compressed and released, compre exactly like waves would do, and within a few hours it sorted them, all the reptiles in one layer, all the fish in one layer. Now, the evolutionists say that the geologic column is evidence for their theory of evolution. The geologic column is evidence of a flood. It's exactly what a flood would do, just by pressing and releasing the pressure on the, on the sand particles at the bottom. After floods, after big floods like Mississippi or something like that, they'll find the sediments are stratified down for 50 or 60 feet below the bed of the river. It actually has an effect that deep down into the sediments. We'll get into more of that later. Okay. The Bible says the scoffers are ignorant of the creation and the flood. And this is referring to Noah's flood, not Lucifer's flood. There was no such thing as Lucifer's flood. Next verse says, uh, by the way, let me say this. If there was a flood to kill spirit beings, how's that going to work, you know? Was it a spiritual flood? In which case, what evidence is it going to leave in the physical world? Secondly, we know from other stuff we'll study later that Lucifer did not even fall from heaven until way after the creation. We know from Ezekiel 28, he was in Eden until iniquity was found in him. And the Garden of Eden wasn't made until day six. We'll get into more of that later. But 2 Peter 3 says, The heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God is keeping things preserved until judgment day. So the scoffers are ignorant of three things. And you need to know this for the quiz. The scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation. They don't want to admit God created the world because that means God owns it and there might be some rules. They're also ignorant of the flood because they don't want to admit there was a flood because that means uh, God has the right to judge his creation. And he does, folks. This is his world. He can wreck it any time he wants. And they sure don't want to admit there's a coming judgment. But judgment is coming anyway, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and we're going to be judged by everything we've ever said or thought or done. Except the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed me from all sin. So I'm excited about that for Judgment Day. I won't have to answer for everything because it's all taken care of. Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. Saw that on a bumper sticker one time. <laughs> boy, that's true. Sometimes we get excited about, boy, the Lord's coming back. Have you thought about that? I mean, what if he came back now? Would you be happy? A lot of folks would say, hey, Lord, glad you're here. Could you come back tomorrow? I'm not quite ready yet, you know. <laughs> Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. You skip down to verse 5, and it says, The evening and the morning were the first day. Notice the word the, T-H-E. In English, that is called the definite article. You know what the three articles are? A, an, and the. Right. The or the. Uh, the a first day. This is called the definite article. If I said, go get me a spoon. Well, that's not definite. It could be any spoon, right? If I said, go get me the spoon. Well, now you know I'm talking about a particular one, right? And it says it was the first day. Now, in the Hebrew, the I don't speak in Hebrew, but the Hebrew scholars tell me that this phrase here says day one. It gives it a specific number. It was day number one. Then the next one is day number two. I mean, it's just, it could not be more definite. It's the most definite way to possibly say it in Hebrew. Day one, day two, day three, day four, etc., on through. And I use King James Version for lots of reasons. We get into that later. 
If you want a good website, avpublications.com. I've talked to Gail Ripplinger many times. She got some kind of disease that put her flat on her back for six years, I believe, in bed. She was an English professor, Ph.D. in English. She taught at the university or college out there someplace in Virginia, I believe. And so while she's laying flat on her back in bed for six or seven years, she read every other version of the Bible that she could get her hands on and kept copious notes on all this and is just considered one of the world's experts on this topic. Several folks have written nasty books, clawing her all sorts of things, you know, and I've read uh, some of the other stuff written against her. When I'd read that stuff, first thing I do, I call her up. Hey, Gail, they're saying this about you. What's your answer? Give her a chance to defend herself. Every time she's had an awesome answer. I find that with a lot of people that get picked on by the scoffers, you know. Uh, call them up and let them defend themselves. <laughs> I tell people, if you have something to say to me, call me and ask me. Tell me, you know. If you disagree with me on something, tell me. I'll, I'll fix it or show you where you're wrong. One, you know. <laughs> if I'm wrong, believe me, I'll fix it. But if you're wrong, are you willing to fix it? So there's a lot of things that have been changed from other versions of the Bible. Now, some people go real overboard on this topic, I think. Um, I would rather have somebody read NIV than Playboy. Okay, so it depends what you want to compare this with. There's an awful lot of good Christians that read other versions of the Bible. They love the Lord as much as I do. I don't think they've studied the subject carefully, and I won't get into a lot of that now about the Alexandrian manuscript and all that, but there's a good reason why you should stick with King James. I realize some of the words are a little hard to understand. There's about 20 archaic words that we no longer use in English. Well, learn those 20 words, and then you're fine. Everybody wants to bring the Bible down to their intellect. Well, how about bringing your intellect up to the Bible instead? I mean, wouldn't that be smart? So you might want to look up avpublications.com or the video transparent tra uh, translations. It really is amazing showing some of the changes that have been made. For instance, if you have an NIV or some of the newer Bibles, look up uh, Acts 8.37. It's not there. It goes Acts 8.35, 8.36, You see, where's their verse 37? I mean, it's gone. 200 verses are just flat gone. And they're all listed in uh, on avpublications.com. You can get it there. Uh, we've got a whole shelf full of books in the library there about this topic on, you know, the King James versus other versions of the Bible. But uh, I got, matter of fact, I've got all my Bibles in there too, a collection of other versions of the Bible, and you're welcome to look through that. In the Revised Standard Version, which I got saved from, I was in the Methodist Church in fourth grade, perfect attendance. That was a little tough, but uh, we got a Bible for perfect attendance for fourth grade. The Bible, they called it a Bible. It was a Revised Standard Version, one of the most liberal versions there is. They have changed thousands of things in that one. But I got to reading all my different versions of the Bible to see how they handled the creation story. This one says, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning one day. Now keep in mind, the Hebrew language called for the definite day one, day two. This is a subtle change. One day instead of day one, totally takes away the definiteness of the, of the phrase. And they did this on purpose, I'm convinced. They don't like the idea of six literal days of creation. They want to say there's a gap between verse one and verse two. Some people, this was thought up by a Scottish preacher named Chalmers in 1814. He, I, I don't know the guy, obviously, but he probably was a well-meaning fella trying to make Millions of years fit into the Bible. A lot of people fall into this trap. Some scientists start teaching something, and so everybody runs around and says, we have to make the Bible fit with this. That's what, that's what Hugh Ross's problem is. Hugh Ross was trained up to believe the earth is billions of years old. Evolution is a fact. Now, how do we make the Bible fit with that? And he's working, he's a very nice guy, and he's working very hard to make the Bible fit with what he thinks is true. And there's the problem. I think if you approach this properly, you'll say, okay, the Bible is the Word of God. Now, how do we make these things we see from science fit with this? I know of no conflicts between the Bible and real science. I know of lots of conflicts between the Bible and evolution, but there are no conflicts between the Bible and science. That's real science is the truth comes from God. So they tried to say there's a gap between there, and probably Al uh, Chalmers was a nice guy who wanted to make the Bible believable to the scientists, so he said there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 that has billions of years in here. This is called the gap theory. Okay, You need to know that. Explain the gap theory. And you just have to say that there's a, they teach there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. The theory goes like this. 
God made the heaven and the earth. Then there's a pause for billions of years while Satan falls from heaven and the pre-Adamite world is wiped out. And then God takes six days to rebuild the world so Adam can live on it again. It's called the Ruin Restoration Theory. J. Sidlow Baxter wrote a great big huge book which I've got in the library there. It's an excellent book, by the way. We had it for a, a, a class I took at Midwestern Baptist College. It's called Explore the Book by J. Sidlow Baxter. He says, between the first two verses of Genesis, there is ample scope for all the geologic eras. They say there was a pre-Adamite rebellion and the judgment of Lucifer happened. Well, there's a couple of problems with this. When did Lucifer fall from heaven? And was there anybody here before Adam? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Adam was the first man. Was there a civilization here before Adam? The Bible says Adam was the first man. 1 Corinthians 15. It's pretty clear on that. And in Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. Moses is getting the Ten Commandments from God. And the Lord is talking about to honor the Sabbath. But there's an interesting statement in here. He said, honor the Sabbath day, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, because, or for, the word for means because, in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth. By the way, let me pause on this. Eric, you may run into some guys who say, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Have you run into that yet? You get saved and get baptized. And they always use Acts uh, 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That word for is a tricky word. If I say, John is in jail for stealing watermelons. What does the word for mean? Is he in jail because he already stole the watermelons or because they're going to teach him how to do it? Because he already did it, right? So the word for in that sense means because something's already been done, it's already over with. He's in jail for stealing watermelons. So the word for in Acts 8.32, repent and be baptized because your sins are forgiven. That's what it means. If baptism was part of salvation it would have to be mentioned in every verse where salvation is mentioned. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would be deceitful for God to say, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Or John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why isn't baptism mentioned there? I think baptism is important. It's a first step of obedience, but it's nothing to do with salvation. It cannot be. And they read into that Acts, 8, 30, or Acts 2, 38 because of that word for right there. When it, for, look it up in the dictionary. It has many different meanings. For in six days, in other words, because, honor the Sabbath, because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Now you tell me, what is left out of this? Yeah. Nothing, right? <laughs> wouldn't that be pretty all-inclusive? Yeah. That would be pretty all-inclusive, wouldn't it? Heaven, earth, sea, and everything in them. I can't think of anything that's not in one of those three. So it looks to me like he's trying to say he made it all in six days. Now, the word made and created, I've got a list. I think I sent you the list, Eric, when you were in college and that teacher was saying, you know, that the, there's a difference between made and created. There are hundreds of places where they're used interchangeably. Because the gap theory folks try to say, you know, did, he, he created the, some, some, things, some things and he made other things. And they really get you confused on this if you're not careful. Uh, but there is no difference, okay? He created and made. Is, you, the words are used interchangeably all through the Scripture. And if you'd like that list, holler, I can uh, email it to you if I ever get my email to work. <clears throat> I'm liking not having that thing working, you know. i got 200 and... I think it's 280, I think. I don't remember what he said. Stuck in my email box and it won't open because it's too full. So, fine, leave them there. Uh, Exodus 20 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. The next verse, next part of that verse says, And he rested the seventh day. Now think, if the gap theory is true, and there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2, would that be the seventh day when he rested? No, it would be billions of years later, right? But all through Scripture, it keeps referring to the seventh day. On the seventh day, God ended his work. Now this is an inter interesting verse that it appears that there was nothing else done after day 6. No, no new creation. 
Only a rearranging of molecules and stuff that's already been created. Nothing new is created as you grow. You take in food, you rearrange the molecules and make it part of your body. So apparently there's been no new creation. Some have argued, what about when Jesus took the little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 people? Did he create new material there? I don't know. That's one of the questions I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven. Does this mean he can't create anything after this? No. He can still create something if he wants. But it appears that he rested the seventh day from all his work. And some have argued, and I don't know where to go on this yet, so if you find a positive answer, let me know. But uh, uh, it appears like he finished his creation on day six. He rested the seventh day. In Genesis 2, it was the seventh day. The seventh day, mentioned in Hebrews chapter 4. It was the seventh day that God rested. So the Bible's real clear that it was six days of work and one day of rest. Now, this is the only day, day seven, where it does not say the evening and the morning were the seventh day. Some have argued that this day of rest goes on forever after that. And Henry Morris has a good note in his uh, Defender's Bible about this, uh, uh, the seventh day and how we enter into God's rest. Some have argued, I think intelligently and probably correctly, that the six days of creation represent 6,000 years of human history. And the seventh day represents the thousand-year reign of Christ, which is mentioned later in Revelation about we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So if there are going to be six days of God working and one day of God resting, then we are expecting the Lord to come any moment. People say, you think the Lord's going to come in the year 2000? Well, I don't know. hope so. But you know, this is the 2000 based on the birth of Christ. We know our calendar is at least four, three or four or five years off. Jesus was not born in the year zero. Um, so we're already, there was no year zero. They didn't have a zero. Good point. It went from 1 AD to BC to 1 AD. Um, but what if the Lord's coming back 2,000 years from the resurrection instead of from the birth of Christ? Then we've got, you know, 30 more years. Or, uh, that's a horrible thought, I know, but what if God's not... E what if God's not even using our calendar? What if he has his own? <gasps> so I wouldn't, you know, sell my clothes and go stand on a hill and say, the Lord's coming, you know, in five minutes. Uh, I would just keep serving the Lord. And don't charge up your credit cards and say, now, Lord, come back and get me out of here. Uh, don't, don't do that. We might, have, we, might have, we might have hundreds of more years down here. And our job as Christians is to, you know, stay here and do be faithful until he comes and gets us out. Okay, Romans 5 is pretty clear. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Why do we have death in the world? Why do things die? Because of sin. The Bible is real clear about this. The Bible said, the Lord told Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And he did. Now, the word death is interesting. There are several different types of death. There's physical death. I'm going to write that one down. Physical death is separation from the body. Then there's eternal death. That is separation from God. We're born, we're spiritually dead. We're separated from God spiritually. We're, but we're not eternally separated from God yet. So there's an eternal death, which is going to come later. The worst that can happen to a Christian is the physical death. We can't experience the eternal death, the separation from God. It's only, uh, it's only temporary. The Bible says in Romans 5, death reigned from Adam to Moses. What do you think that verse means? It started with Adam, doesn't it? Now, guys like Hugh Ross, who are very nice guys, who will say, you know, death has been here for a long time before Adam got here. What do you do with a verse like this? He will say, well, this just means human death. Is that what it says? How about Romans 5? By one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. Is that does that say human death? It just says death, right? 1 Corinthians, by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die. So they will say, well, don't you think Adam could have stepped on an ant? Mm -hmm. Sure could have. Could Adam have, could Adam have uh, eaten some leaves and the cells died? Yeah, sure could have. That depends on what you mean by life, though. What is, are plants alive? Well, this one is not. It's a, <laughs> a fake one. But uh, 
Suppose a plant is nothing but a complex, self-replicating food source. Does it have a soul? No. Does it have a spirit? No. Al Gore thinks it does, I know. <laughs> but it doesn't, Al Gore. Uh, it's a self-replicating food source. So it's not alive in the sense of having the breath of life like we do. Right. So it can't die. The Bible says the trees wither. The grass withers. But they don't die like we die. It's very different. So I think before Adam sinned, there simply was no death in the world. Now, that gets into the question of, are insects alive? Do they have the breath of life? Well, they, they absorb oxygen through their skin. They don't breathe like we do. And I don't know if I'd get into, you know, too far down that rabbit trail or not, but I'm not sure insects are alive. Modern definitions are not necessarily God's definitions. And you've got to keep track of this. Eric, you're going to be told sometimes that, uh, you know, because our classification system puts a dog and a wolf differently, therefore God must have made them differently. Well, now, wait a minute. A dog and a wolf are the same kind of animal. Modern classification system puts a whale in the category with mammals, right? Yes. But maybe God's classification puts whales in the category with fish. If it lives in the water, it's a fish. It wouldn't mean God was wrong. That means we have a different way of classifying it. That's all. Not right or wrong. It's just a different classification system. The Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, if evolution theory is true, or if the gap theory is true, now think for a minute, death was already here in the world, and it's an important part of how we get ahead. Think, if, evol if evolution is true, one animal evolves a little bit better than the rest of them, right? What has to happen to the rest of them in order for evolution to really work? They all have to die, right? So if you get a dog that's a little bit faster than the rest of them, the slow ones have to die so the fast one can pass on his genes to the next generation. So according to evolution theory, death is important for the process to work. You must have death, and that's how we get ahead. That's not God's plan. The Bible says death is an enemy, and it shall be destroyed. Went to my mom's funeral a few weeks ago. Death is an enemy. It's not going to happen in heaven. Just, it's a sting right now. You know, the sting of death the Bible talks about, and we're going to die one of these days, uh, unless the Lord comes back. But death is an enemy. Let's take a little break. When we come back in a minute, we'll finish up more about the uh, uh, original creation, what it was like in the canopy theory, right after the break. This is 128, the verse most often used to support the gap theory. They will say, uh, God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now, the word replenish means fill again. If I say, Eric, would you please replenish my supply of water? That means I drank it all. It's now gone. I want you to fill it back up. That's what the word replenish means today. Actually, the Hebrew word here is male, which means fill. And so back in 1611, when they did the King James Version of the Bible, they came to the word male, and they said, oh, this means replenish. Because the word replenish back then meant fill. There's a different Hebrew word, shana, which means to do something a second time. If God was telling Adam to fill the earth a second time because it's been destroyed, he would have said shana instead of male. See, in 1611, the word replenish meant fill. That's what it meant. That was the common use of the word. As best anybody can figure out from tracing through old books and old dictionaries and stuff, about 1650, the word replenish started meaning fill again. English words change meanings all the time. When I was a kid, the word cool meant not hot. What does cool mean today? <laughs> When I was a kid, gay meant happy. I mean, if you remember that, I mean, we said, you said, oh, I'm gay today. I mean, you say that all the time, wouldn't you? Well, you don't say that today, right? It's a matter of the word changing meanings in its everyday use, and that's what happened to the word replenish. The verses they use to also uh, support the gap theory is Isaiah chapter 4, I believe, and Jeremiah, maybe it's Jeremiah chapter 4. You can look up in a Schofield Bible that has the gap theory in there. But it says, the earth was uh, without form and void. It's a Hebrew, tohu vabohu. It means unformed and unfilled. If I back up with a load of lumber to build a house and dump it off on the lot, and you walk up and say, hey, what's the matter with your house? Did a hurricane knock it down or something? Well, no, it's just it's not done yet. We are just starting to build it. At the moment I dump off the lumber, the material's on the site, but the house is unformed, and there's nobody living in it. It is unfilled. That's what happened. 
God created the heaven and the earth and it was unformed and unfilled. He wasn't done yet. It does not mean it's been destroyed. And they will say the Hebrew word hava in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says, they'll, some say it means became. The earth became without form and void. I recommend you get the book uh, uh, about the gap theory, Unformed, Unfilled. We sell, sell it through our ministry. It goes into all of the details on this if you want to read, take a, a three-hour course just on this topic. But the gap theory simply is not true. There are lots of problems with it, and I'll show you in a minute. Ezekiel 28 tells us Lucifer was in Eden. Now, this Ezekiel 28 passage is talking about the king of Tyre, but it's very obvious from reading it, it is symbolic of Satan. Oftentimes, different things in the Bible happen, and God talks to a person, but it's also very obvious he's talking well beyond that person. And it's, it's symbolic, or it's called a typology, of something else. And this is, uh, king of Tyre is a type of Satan. It's obviously not the king of Tyre, because it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Do you think the king of Tyre was in the garden of Eden? No, this is referring to Lucifer. Uh, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then it describes these precious stones for the next four verses, the tablets and pipes and all this stuff. And it says, Till iniquity was found in thee. Well, now, if Lucifer was in Eden until iniquity was found in him, and it's pretty obvious the Garden of Eden wasn't made till day six, then he couldn't fall from heaven between verse one and verse two, could he? So to get around this problem, the gap theory folks have invented a second Garden of Eden. They'll say, well, this is the Garden of Eden on earth, and Lucifer fell from the Garden of Eden in heaven. I say, would you please show me any scriptures that talk about a Garden of Eden in heaven? They say, well, there aren't any. But there must have been one, because after all, Satan was in it. <laughs> now you're adding a lot to the Word of God, in my opinion. If you just gave the Bible to 5,000 people who knew nothing about this and said, would you read this and tell me what it says, none of them would come up with the second Garden of Eden in heaven. None of them. And it's pretty obvious. The thing you got to really watch for, Eric, as you, everybody does, I guess, as you go through life, you'll find a lot of people who want you to believe they have to have, or you have to have them to understand God's Word. This is how cults get started. You know, the Bible says this really. You, you know, let me explain it to you. And if, you, if somebody says, you can't just read it and get most of what it says, you need me to explain it to you, you're probably in a cult. That's the problem. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are told, you know, don't, don't listen to other people's opinions. Don't read the anti-Jehovah's Witness literature because they might, you know, poison you. Well, they might rescue you is what they might do, you know. I went to a Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall one time. They're all in there getting ready for their Saturday meeting to go out soul damning like they do every Saturday. And so I went in there with one of these tracks, 15 reasons why I cannot be a Jehovah's Witness. And I met this lady in the parking lot. I said, would you please read this? She looked at it. She said, is this anti-Jehovah's Witness literature? I said, well, ma'am, it's literature about the Bible and about the truth. She said, no, I can't read that. That's anti-Jehovah's Witness literature. I said, I stuck a $20 bill with it. I said, ma'am, here, I'll give you 20 bucks if you read it. She said, no, I can't read that. The elders, or whatever they call them from there, whatever it is, a cult came out and said, get off our property. I said, what's the problem? They said, you're passing out literature. I said, what do you guys do all day long? What are you getting ready to do right now? <laughs> you can't. They won't read it. See, um, they've been taught you know, anything against what we believe. When you get into a cult, it's always that way. Here's the truth. Listen to me. Nobody else know, understands. You know, i got to explain this book to you. And you get guys like Hugh Ross and I hate to keep using his name, but he's the best example I can think of today, who has got this ministry built up. Everybody thinks they have to have Hugh to explain the Bible to them. You don't have to have Hugh to explain the Bible to you. Just read it, okay? There's plenty. Now, there's a lot of things in the Bible I don't understand, okay? I'll be the first to admit that. That's not what bothers me. But the things that bother me is the things I do understand. <laughs> That's what bothers me out of that book. But... Uh, when they say you have to have me to explain it to you, I, red flags go up all over in my mind, and they ought to in yours also. You just give the Bible to a bunch of folks and say, what does this mean? And I'm telling you, nearly 100% would come up with the idea that God said he did it in six days. In the radio debate I had with Hugh Ross, I said, if you gave the Bible to a bunch of folks, nobody would come up with what you're teaching about the gap theory. He said, well, there's a little old lady in Arkansas that called me and said she came up with this idea all by herself. I said, well, I don't know if what your story is telling me is, not, is true or not, but you got one little old lady in Arkansas. Give it to 5,000 more people and see what they think. Nobody would come up with what you've, what you've talked about here in your books about the different things that he believes. Anyway, Job 38. 
It says, all the sons of God. And if you read Henry Morris's footnote on this, uh, the sons of God, the phrase is used several times in the Bible. It's, it's always referring to the angels. In Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God intermarried with the daughters of men. And it's referring to the angels. Uh, I, there's, I don't claim to understand it all. I just know that every place the phrase is used, it means the angels. So here it's saying, The angel shouted for joy when God laid the foundations of the earth. What day of the seven days of creation did the, God lay the foundations of the earth? This wasn't the first day. He created heaven and earth, and then he did, did lots of things to that for the next six days. For one thing, he separated the water from the dry land. Probably that's when he made the uh, foundations of the earth because it appears that the crust of the earth, the continental crust, is, is much thicker than the ocean crust. It appears that it actually has foundations, like it sits in sockets in the, in the Moho, what's called the Moho Revisic Discontinuity. So the angels were rejoicing when they saw God lay the foundations of the earth, which means the angels must have been created on day one or day two. The Bible doesn't tell us when they were created, but it must have been early in the six days because by the time he laid the foundations of the earth, they were rejoicing. Some have said this verse proves the angels were created before the six days of creation. No, it does not prove that. They were rejoicing when they saw the foundations laid, which was not necessarily on day one. Okay, Genesis 131, this is the end of the chapter. God saw everything and that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, this is the end of chapter 1. According to the gap theory, Satan fell from heaven between verse 1 and verse 2. And according to the gap theory, the earth had been totally destroyed, <coughs> wiped out, and the earth is filled with zillions of fossils of dead things from this catastrophe. If Adam and Eve are walking around in a garden on top of thousands of feet of dead things, and Lucifer is running around as a bad guy, would God be able to look at everything and say it was very good? I don't think so. I think this verse indicates Satan had not fallen from heaven yet until well after the six days of creation. The only clues we have as far as when Satan fell are Adam was 130 when Seth was born. That's the first date we really have. 130 years old. Before that, Cain and Abel are born, but no dates are given. So they really could have been in the garden maybe 100 years. You know, how old was Cain when he killed Abel? Anybody know? The Bible doesn't say, does it? I would assume he would be, you know, teenager or more, right? By that time, do you think Adam and Eve had any other kids? Yeah, yeah probably a bunch more, right? You figure you got unlimited food supply. <laughs> Why not have a hundred kids? You don't have to feed them. Doesn't hurt to have babies? You can vouch for that? No, it's, it's not at that time. Oh, at that time? Not at that time. <laughs> I had three. It didn't hurt at all. Uh, <laughs> I had years to do pretty soon. You can tell us. I, you know, I didn't feel a thing. But uh, the, I'm not sure how old Cain was when he killed Abel. But let's assume he was, uh, pick a number. Say he's 30 years old. By then, Adam and Eve have 10 more kids or 15 more kids. And so Cain kills Abel, buries him in the ground. The Lord comes down and says, what have you done? You know, your brother's blood cries from the ground. And the Lord puts a mark on Cain. The Bible doesn't tell us what it was. Some people think he became a giant. Some people think he became a different color. They think that's where part of the races came from. I don't know. But uh, whatever it was, Cain takes off with his wife and moves to the land of Nod. The skeptics say, where did Cain get a wife? Well, he married one of his sisters. They probably had a bunch of kids by then. And he didn't say he went to the land of Nod and found his wife. It says he went to the land of Nod and knew his wife and they had children. So he took her with him. It's one of his sisters. So here we got a time before the flood when they're living 900 years. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. That's really the first date we can hang a, a doctrine on. And so before that, they were kicked out of the garden. So I say, I say they probably could have been in the garden for 100 years. And I think Lucifer got jealous of this fellowship Adam and Eve were having with God. And the Bible says Lucifer was, you know, beautiful and perfect in all his ways. And he probably said, you know, they, they really ought to be worshiping me. After all, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good looking myself and I'm pretty smart and they ought to worship me. And apparently it was pride that caused Lucifer to fall. He came down and told Eve, if you eat off that tree, you can be like God. 
and he you know, upset the whole thing that God had made. But God's going to fix it back. Here's the problems with the gap theory. It was invented in 1814 by a Scottish preacher named Chalmers. It is certainly not the historical position of the church. You have to be careful with this doctrine because a lot of people say, well, if the church teaches something for many years, it automatically becomes true. Be careful with that, okay? So this would be a weak point, but it is an interesting point that if the gap theory is true, why did nobody find out about this truth until 1814? I don't think God writes a book like that. Secondly, it violates scriptures. Genesis 1.5 says it was the first day. The gap theory would violate that one. Genesis 2, uh, 2 and 3, Exodus 20, 11, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Hebrews, uh, Genesis 2, 2 and Hebrews 4, 4 both say it was the seventh day. So the gap theory would violate those scriptures. It puts death before sin. That certainly goes against what the Bible teaches, that there was no death until Adam sinned. And it has Satan fall before day seven, which I think goes against Genesis 131, where God says everything was perfect. And Ezekiel 28, where it tells us Lucifer was in Eden until iniquity was found in him. Genesis 2.8 talks about the Garden of Eden being made on day 6. So I think the gap theory has some problems. Uh, if you didn't get those verses down, you can check out video number 2 of our series. Yes, sir? Now, does Hugh Ross believe in the day age theory or the gap theory? Kind of a combination, I believe. Uh, if you say, did he make the earth in 6 days? Yes, he did. But that was remaking the earth after some catastrophe and he had to get it ready for Adam. You say, Hugh, was there life here? Was there, were there humans here before Adam? He'll say, no, no, no. They weren't human. They were Neanderthals. They had no soul. They buried their dead and they you know, had art and they put flowers in there with them and they believed in you know, some kind of afterlife because they you know, carefully buried their dead, but they had no souls. So God picked one and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became the first human. He became Adam. The rest were just Neanderthals. That's what he teaches. I don't know where you get that from Scripture, but that's you know what he says. Okay. In the Living Bible, which I've got on the shelf in there, it says, Let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees. All this occurred on the third day. Now, if you know the history about the Living Bible, Ken Taylor wanted to rewrite the Bible for, to, tell, to tell stories to his kids, Bible stories at night. Probably a very sincere, honest motivation. He did not have enough knowledge of the original languages to know what he was doing and made thousands of mistakes in, in changing things, to ch totally changing the meaning. Really serious mistakes. I don't think that he intended it to be a Bible. He intended it to be a Bible story. But people have you know bought that thing like crazy and sold it as a a Bible. I don't know what Ken Taylor's position on is it now, uh, what his position now is on this topic, but I know there are some serious mistakes in it. I have a couple of those in there, Living Bible. Um, he says at the bottom, though, he's got a footnote that says, this is not really a day, it's really a period of time. You ever heard that idea before? Maybe the days aren't really days, maybe they're long periods of time. Somebody sent me a few months ago the Fenton Bible. I don't know if you saw this one, Eric, on the shelf in there. Made in 1903. Look at Genesis 1.1. By periods, God created that which produced the solar systems. Then, that which produced the earth. Does that sound like Genesis 1-1 to you? No, not to me. He's trying to say this is each day is a different period, right? Look at this in verse number 5. And to the light, God gave the name of day, and to the darkness, he gave the name of night. This was the close and the dawn of the first age. Is that what the Bible says? Look at verse 8. This was the close and the dawn of the second age. Now, where does Mr. Fenton get this? He's trying in 1903. you got to understand now, there was not much of a creation movement. And by then, it had been 50 years of teaching evolution. And just about everybody had been swallowed up in this teaching of evolution. So I assume Mr. Fenton is a Farrar Fenton is a nice guy, and he's a smart guy, and he's trying to make the Bible fit with science. Right? There's his problem. Actually, he's trying to make the Bible fit with evolution. He's not trying to make it fit with science. And I get this all the time. When I spoke at the junior college a couple days ago, I was there for three hours, you know, they always try to say it's religion versus science. And the subtle unspoken meaning to that is 
evolution gets in here, it's part of science. I say, no, no, no. The Bible is nothing against science, but we have a lot against evolution. And the problem is you keep mixing evolution in with the Bible. And I'm sure you face this, you know, all the time. When evolution with science. I fix, you try to mix evolution with science, right? I'm sorry. And they do this constantly, don't they? Mm -hmm. And if you, it's easy to spot once you learn to look for it. They do it all the time. Oh, there you went again. You mixed your science in with evolution. There's your problem right there. And after pointing it out about 15 times, you'd think they'd stop doing it, but they won't. They don't ever figure it out. That's all they've got, okay? Psalm chapter 90 says, A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And so there's those who believe in what is called the day-age theory, and there'll be two questions on the quiz, two theories people have proposed to try to put millions of years into the Bible. One is the gap theory. The other is the day-age theory, which says maybe the days weren't really days. Maybe each day represents a long period of time. And this is one of their proof verses they will use. Psalm 90, and the other one is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And they always quote this, but they don't quote the rest of the verse. And a thousand years is as one day. So this cancels it out. <laughs> right? First thing, a couple things I'd like to point out. Neither one of these verses, Psalms 90 or 2 Peter 3, neither one are talking about the creation. No place is the creation mentioned here. This is talking about the fact that time doesn't mean anything to God. God does not have a watch. Doesn't have a clock. Doesn't have a calendar. This is not the year 2000 in heaven. There is no time. Now, my brain will not wrap around that thought. I've thought about it till my brain hurts, but I can't figure it out. But there is no time in heaven. There's all sorts of illustrations we give to try to explain things, but every illustration breaks down at some point. Let me give you the best illustration I've seen so far. We're in a helicopter hovering miles over Grand Canyon. We're up there with binoculars and a walkie-talkie, a radio. Down in the canyon, there are people launching on raft trips to go down through Grand Canyon. Raft number one takes off. He's going through the canyon. Six, days, or six hours later, raft number two takes off. He's going through the canyon. Six hours later, another raft takes off. Every six hours, a new, new bunch launches down the canyon. None of them can see each other. All of them can see me. You got me so far? I'm in a helicopter overhead. All of them can see me. All of them can talk to me. I can see all of them, and I can talk to all of them, but none of them can see each other. They're too far spread out in this canyon. Okay. This canyon represents time. It's a one-way street. You can't go back to yesterday. You can't jump ahead to tomorrow. Many times I've wished I could have gone back, even just a few minutes. <laughs> right? And unsaid something that I said, right? I uh, heard one preacher, he was preaching along, and he said something. He grabbed the microphone, you know, the thing holding the microphone up. He said, ah, it's too late, it got out, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's too late, preacher, it got out. you got to be faster than that. Um, this canyon represents time. Everybody in there is in a particular different time. One's in 1991, one's in 1992, 1993, 94. God is in the helicopter. He sees all of them at the same time. Because to him, he's outside of the river. He's not stuck in the river. We're stuck in the river. He's not stuck in it at all. Right now, God is looking at yesterday and tomorrow and today all at the same time. Just it's all right there in front of him. Now, if you were in a canyon going down in a raft and you couldn't see what's around the next bend, wouldn't it be nice to have a radio and talk to somebody in a helicopter and he could say, oh, you better stay to the left, there's rapids coming. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Isn't it nice having a God you can go pray and talk to and see? He says, oh, you better do this because I see what's coming tomorrow. And don't you feel dumb when you don't listen, when God speaks to you and you don't listen, and sure enough, bang, you run into the tree. You know? <laughs> Clap, there it was, whoops. <laughs> That's the best illustration I know of is the canyon illustration. It's, it's time. God's outside of time. People say, what did God do for millions of years before the creation? Well, that very question assumes that God is stuck in time like we are. When somebody says, what did God do for millions of years? Well, hold it. 
You don't think God's big enough to be outside of time, space, and matter? See, there was no time. Now, I can't, like I said, my brain won't quite wrap around this. I'm working on it. I'm stretching as far as I can go, but all I can tell you is what the Bible says. There was no time before the creation, and someday there will be no time after the creation. We sing an awful lot of songs in church that really aren't, aren't correct. When we've been there 10,000 years, that's not true. We're not going to be there 10,000 years. Just going to be there. Your wife will never make you late again. <laughs> My daughter, be on time for everything. Because there won't be any time. It's going to be great. First thing you do, you get to heaven. Take your watch. Bling it off the side. Heard one preacher say, man, I, when I get to heaven, I'm going to take out the bi uh, bifocals and fling them off the side. <laughs> take out these false teeth and fling them over the side. <laughs> he went on and on and on about all the things he's got wrong with him, you know. He said, there ain't going to be much of me in heaven, but we're going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> one day is like a thousand years. A day is like a thousand years. You are sitting in the room looking at this timeline. You can, from your vantage point, see everything. You can see Abe Lincoln, see Christopher Columbus, see the Vikings, see the disciples spreading around, developing the church. You can see uh, King David, Moses, Abraham. They can't see each other. But we are outside of the timeline is why we can see all of them simultaneously. That's the best I can do on explaining that one. When we get to heaven... Uh, we will uh, understand it. I was in a debate one time. I don't know if you were there, Eric, when this uh, smart aleck kid got up and he said, uh, what are you going to do uh, if you die or if you get to heaven? And oh, I forget the exact way he said it. It was so funny, though. Uh, oh, he said, do you, what are you gonna, do you believe about Noah and the flood or something like that? And I said, he asked a question about that. And I said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And he said, what are you going to do if he's not in heaven? I said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> um, well, what else could I have said, you know? I get criticized once in a while. Dan, you would know about this. People write letters and say, you know, too sarcastic or something like that. You know, we get letters occasionally like that, don't we? Okay, I say, well, I kind of have the Elijah personality, you know. Maybe your God's sleeping, you know, or cry louder. <laughs> I, just, I have so much fun making fun of evolution, I just can't help it. I just can't help myself. Anyway, Genesis chapter 1 says, God made the grass, the plants, and the trees on the third day. He made the sun on the fourth day. Now, those who try to say those days might be millions of years have a little problem here. How long can the plant survive without the sun? Millions of years? One day? No problem. A thousand years? That's a problem, right? Plants need sunlight. They can go actually a few days without sunlight. Maybe a few weeks. But they can't go a few thousand years. Also, we know the insects were made either on day five or day six. I can't figure out when the insects were made, but one of those two days. Either day five or day six, but it certainly wasn't on day three or four. Just about every plant requires some kind of insect or bird or animal to pollinate it. How did the plants get pollinated with no insects and no birds for millions of years? So if those days represent millions of years, you have a real biological problem here. Plus, if they're supposed to work 6,000 years and then rest for 1,000, you got a problem there. God said, work six days and rest one. That was his original plan. Which, by the way, that's one of the only things in Scripture that of the Old Testament that's never been lifted. I get letters all the time. You know, Don't you think you ought to be... Worshiping on the Sabbath? I say, yes, I do. You ought to worship on the seventh day and the first day. You ought to worship all seven days. But I think they've got something there about as far as resting. There's a friend of mine, Richard Reeves. You know you know, Richard Reeves took over. He's got a website, toolong.com. Too long in the sun. He says, look, folks, we ought to be resting on, the sa on Saturday. Just rest. Take a day off and rest. Hmm? I ought to listen, yes. <laughs> People say, well, God, even God rested the seventh day. I said, well, yeah, God rested because he was done. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I 
I'm working though. This book about the day, age, and the gap theory would be a good one. Unformed and unfilled. Uh, it's eight bucks for our ministry if you want to get that. It's really thorough. Uh, it's one of those go down deep, stay down long, come up dry kind of books. Uh, really got a lot of good stuff in there. Okay, one more thought and we'll quit here. Genesis 1.6. God said, let there be a firmament. The word firmament is the Hebrew word rakei, which means um, thin metal laminated sheets. That is according to Carl Baugh. Walt Brown and I had a long talk here this this week in Phoenix, and uh, he's not convinced that that meaning, rakei, is, is correct. It's Hebrew R-A-Q-U-A-I or something. Uh, we talked about it, and he just says there is no evidence. Now, when somebody, I do debates all the time, and when they say there is no evidence for a flood, for instance, watch out for that phrase. When somebody says there is no evidence for, does that mean they know everything? Or does that phrase mean there is no evidence that you are aware of? Or does that mean there is evidence against? Just when they say there is no evidence for, red flags go up in my mind. Oh, wait, wait, no, what do you mean by this? Does this mean you know you've studied the whole thing, you know all about it, or does this mean there's just nothing you've seen, you know, on this topic? So, the Bible says this firmament is going to be in the midst of the waters. There's your first clue. And it's going to divide the waters from the waters. There's your second clue. So that's the firmament, whatever it is, is in the middle of the water and it divides the water from the water. Because of this, some people say it must be the dirt because the water keeps, you know, the dirt keeps the water away from the water. But if you look at Genesis 1.20, it talks about the firmament of heaven. And it says, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Well, if the birds fly in the firmament, then it's not talking about the dirt because the birds do not fly in the dirt. The birds fly in the atmosphere. So there are three heavens mentioned in the Bible. The first heaven is where the birds fly. This is called the atmosphere. The second heaven is where the stars are. Genesis 1.14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. And God made the two great lights and the stars also. Most people assume, and I think they're correct, that when he made the two great lights, it's referring to the sun and the moon. However, the Bible doesn't say that. It just says he made two great lights. So be cautious that this doesn't say he made the sun. It's, I think it's referring to the sun and the moon, but I don't know that for sure. And he made the stars also. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12.2 says Paul was caught. He's probably talking about himself when he was stoned to death. I did a long paper on this in college one time. And I'm convinced Paul was actually killed outside the city of Lystra, stoned to death, went to heaven, saw it, was sent back down, raised up from the dead. And for the next 14 years, he told people about this experience. Probably the stoning is what caused him to get bad eyesight. And some people have studied this, and I've studied it as carefully as I know how, that Paul, for the rest of his life after this experience, God gave him a thorn in the flesh so he wouldn't get proud of his experience. Ah, I've been to heaven and you haven't. Ha, ha, ha. You know? Because he, he wrote, one of the epistles he wrote, he said, you see how large a letter I've written with mine own hand. That's a clue that probably had bad eyesight and had to write with large letters so he could read it himself. Uh, the theory goes that he got stoned to death. God gave him back his life, but his eyesight was still damaged the rest of his life. That, again, it's just a theory. But Paul was caught up to the third heaven. In Psalm 19, it says, The heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. So the three heavens, as I see it, would be the atmosphere where we're breathing, the outer space where the stars are, and God's heaven, which I don't know where that is. It could be beyond the stars. Genesis 1-7, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So here's another clue now that the water is being put above the firmament and under the firmament. Now, this doesn't tell us which firmament is talking about. Is it the first heaven, the atmosphere, and there's water above it? I think so. Is it the second heaven and there's water above that? What's beyond the stars? Stars and more stars. Well, obviously, if it ends, the next question is, what's on the other side, you know? What if the whole thing is surrounded by a layer of water and the Lord sits upon many waters, like the Bible says in the book of Revelation? What if the third heaven is out beyond that? 
It was a picture. I got to get this. It's so awesome. Somebody showed it to me this week. I think it's from Discover Magazine this month, which would be what? April 2000. They picked a spot in the sky that they thought was black. Was it Discover Magazine? Okay. They say if you take a grain of sand and you hold it at arm's length, that's how big of a section of sky they picked. And the Hubble telescope took, I think it was 260 or 270 pictures of that spot for 10 or 15 or something consecutive nights. They kept photographing that spot and magnified it, put it all together, and there are trillions of stars in that little spot. They got the picture in... It was on PBS, was it? Right. They said at the size of the grain of sand at arm's length, that's a big, how big a spot they picked. And they kept you know, magnifying it and blowing it up, and you couldn't count the stars in that spot. <laughs> there's a lot out there. That's a spot they couldn't see anything. <laughs> the ones where they can see them, there's even more. Anyway, Psalm 148 is an interesting verse that says, Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. I suspect this is talking about water above the stars. I don't know, but I suspect it is. Because it says waters that be. Not waters that were, waters that be. So here's the theory. you got a layer of earth for Adam to stand on, a layer of air to breathe, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 miles, then a layer of water. Then a layer of stars, zillions of them. Then another layer of water. Then the third heaven. And the whole thing that we have for the first and second heaven, which to us is enormous, is probably one of those little glass balls on God's dresser <laughs> that you pick up and shake once in a while, you know, and the stuff floats around. <laughs> I don't know, but that's uh, the best I can figure out. Peter said the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. So I think that's the way it was. Isaiah 40 tells us the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. The heathen years ago tried to say the earth is flat. The Christians knew it was round. And they tried to blame their dumb theory on us. We never said the earth is flat. The Bible says clearly it was round. And he stretched out the heavens. Four times, I believe, that phrase is mentioned in the Bible about the stretching of the heavens. We'll get into more of that later in uh, Seminar Part 7, if we ever get there, on the uh, stretching of the heavens and the uh, how we see starlight and why we have a red shift and all that kind of stuff. Today's atmosphere has six layers. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and ionosphere. And they are distinct layers to the atmosphere. As spaceships go up, you have temperature changes. You have all sorts of radiation changes as they go through these different layers. Apparently, the Earth used to have a seventh layer called a canopy, a canopy of water. Some think it was ice. Now, the skeptics will say, if you, if you had enough water to flood the world, there'd have to be a layer of water up there you know, 2,000 feet thick or something. They'll pick some number. And they'll do the calculations of how much rain it would take to cover Mount Everest. And they'll say, if it rained that much, see, when water, when moisture turns to liquid, it releases heat. When liquid turns to vapor, it absorbs heat. You have to boil it to make this happen. It absorbs all the heat and then poof, flashes and turns to vapor. But when the vapor turns to a liquid, it releases heat. It's called the latent heat of condensation. Well, if all that water rained enough to cover Mount Everest, it would release so much heat, it would cook the world. And they are absolutely correct. They do all the mathematical equations, and they're right. It would fry the world. But they're assuming all the water for the flood came from this canopy. The Bible doesn't say that. They're also assuming it had to cover Mount Everest, aren't they? <laughs> Mount Everest wasn't there. The mountains rose during the last part of the flood. So we'll get into more of this next, uh, next time we have a class on the canopy and the evidence for and against the canopy theory and try to settle the issue. You know, does the Bible teach there was a canopy? I happen to believe it does, and I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming. Though guys like uh, uh, Walt Brown, who's a brilliant man, loves the Lord, got a great book, I recommend it, we sell it. He, do, he believes he's not convinced there was a canopy. I think there was. We talked about that. He said, I don't know the answer to that. Several times in the conversation, I said, what about this? What about this? What about the giant insects that require extra air pressure? He said, I'm not sure about that. Tell you know the answer? <laughs> I said, I think I've got the answer. I think there was a canopy. <laughs> the question is, of course, what held it up there? The theories are that it was a layer of ice 
suspended by the magnetic field, or it's just a layer of, of course, clouds float just fine. Uh, the igloo effect. Eskimo. Would, would they be able to see stars through that? Because it talks about it putting them up in force, or would it act like a magnifying glass? Yeah, Carl Baugh's book, Panorama of Creation, is pretty convincing, though I don't know that there's any experimental evidence for it. He said if you had six or ten inches of ice, perfect, crystal clear, it would you'd be able it'd be like a magnifying glass. You would see the stars better. I wouldn't preach that as dogma. I'd preach it as a theory. Or okay. maybe filter out the lighter ones so that you see the main ones, and that's how they got the constellations. Most of the ancient astronomers said you can see a thousand or so stars in the sky. And today we see a lot more. See a lot more. Either, of course, the ancient astronomers would have been post-flood, so they would have had the atmosphere today. It could be the light from the stars is more still reaching us all the time. We can see more now than they could. I don't know. Interesting study. Study. See you next class. Thank you so much.